we can go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Jessa Frost. I'm the program director at a little place called North House Folk School. And for those of you who haven't gotten to visit us or aren't, don't, aren't familiar with North House, we are a little school uh, on the shore of Lake Superior in Grand Marais. Um, we're, we are devoted to the teaching of traditional Northern craft. And so uh, that means everything from mucklucks to basketry to birch bark canoes to wood fired baking. Um, typically, in a typical year, we welcome about 3,000 students from all over the US to learn with us. And uh, this has not been a typical year. And so we've really changed what we're doing, um, but still really working to try to fulfill our mission of enriching lives and building community through craft. And now you may be wondering how Northern ecology and lichens fit into our definition of craft. And <clears throat> the, the people who, who had the vision to start the school really had an expansive vision of craft. And, and they argued that craft, that, that Northern ecology and keen observation of the landscape is the original craft. It is presupposed in any other craft. You can't harvest the birch bark to build your canoe if you can't if you haven't identified the birch trees and watched them and known the right time. And so keen attention to detail is really part of it's part it's built into every craft um, out there, no matter where you are in the world and no matter what you're making. And so so I think the the naturalists can argue that they are the original, the original crafters. So uh, we are doing a whole series of these. My little two-year-old's popping in to say goodnight. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> and trying to offer a program every Thursday night uh, for people to join in and learn something and hang out together sort of on Zoom. Uh, we have a whole series coming up in November devoted to um, winter topics. Mm. Uh, next week's Thursday night presentation is going to be on Sami uh, knife craft. And so the Sami people are the indigenous people of Scandinavia and Northern Europe. And uh, the Sami Cultural Center is actually located in Duluth, Minnesota. And so we're partnering with them and they are gonna be highlighting their craft, their um, collection of these incredible knives um, made by Sami immigrants. So anyway, lots of good stuff coming up. I hope you are able to stay connected to us, but tonight I'm gonna get to the main act here. I'm really pleased to welcome Joe Waluski, who is with Wolf Ridge Environmental Learning Center He's been there since 1988 and part of creating that incredible resource uh, for all of Minnesota to help us be connected to this landscape that we love and to educate our young folks and adults about uh, what it takes to take care of the North Shore and what's here. And so with all of that, I'm gonna turn it over to Joe. Um, as soon as I tell you that we're gonna save most questions to the end, there are two different ways to ask questions on Zoom. You can use the chat button that you were using in the beginning or the, if, if you hold your mouse over the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A and you can, um, that's a great place to put a question. It's easier for us to not lose track of it because they don't scroll away like the chat ones do. Um, so that would be the place to uh, drop your questions and then we'll get to them all at the end. And otherwise, I think that's what you need to know from me. Joe, you wanna take it away? That's amazing. So thank you very much. What I'm going to do here first, and so Jessa, you're going to have to make sure that this is working for me, is I'm going to share my screen and you can let me know if indeed you're seeing it. Are you? It looks great, Joe. You're set. Perfect. So I won't ask that question anymore. So uh, again, uh, I'm a naturalist. Uh, my name is Joe Valesky and I work at Wolf Ridge Environmental Learning Center. And uh, that while Jessa was talking, I actually took a screenshot so I could get the number of participants because uh, when I wrote the book, Lichens of the Northwoods, my publisher uh, uh, brought me into the office at one point and he said, you know, Joe, nobody's gonna buy this book. And I was, I was mortified. I was like, oh my gosh, I, I, what did I do wrong? And he said, lichens? Nobody knows anything about lichens. Nobody's gonna buy this, but we think it's important to have in our series. Well, today I was talking to him. I told him I was going to be doing this program and in his optimism again, he said, you'll have two people show up. <laughs> so taking that picture helps to prove that he was wrong. 
So this is Wolf Ridge Environmental Learning Center in Finland, Minnesota. And uh, this is our campus. We're on 2,000 acres and we're a residential program. You can see that all those buildings there, that two of them actually are dormitories and they house a total of 360 people. So a really big residential program. Students come from all over the region, from Wisconsin and Minnesota and North Dakota, South Dakota. And over the years, we've even had groups uh, from the Dallas area, from San Francisco and from Boston. I saw that we had some Texas and Boston people there. So I thought I'd make sure you knew that as well. We're closed. It's a residential program. So we're closed. And so uh, we don't have a program going at all. But we do have a program going uh, that uh, what's happening is a few of us naturalists are giving presentations like this. We're also doing classes online uh, for schools. If they ask uh, us to do a class on geology, for example, yesterday we were doing a class for seventh and eighth graders, and uh, we had one of our teachers who was living in St. Paul. He went down to Minnehaha Creek. We have one of our teachers here who went down to a beach on Lake Superior, which actually is in this image, I think, right over to the right there. <laughs> and then I was, I was here in my kitchen uh, and, and mastering the controls here. And so we were able to teach geology in, in two two totally different places and they were outdoors. So it was actually pretty exciting. Some things that we never imagined before. Now, will we continue to do those things when we come back and open up Wolf Ridge? I don't know, maybe, uh, but there's one last thing that we're doing as well, is that we're also uh, going around to different schools that are teaching outdoors and we're helping to coach the teachers to uh, use the outdoors more effectively. And in fact, uh, on Sunday, I drive down towards the Twin Cities and I'm gonna stay uh, uh, just outside uh, west of the cities and work with six elementary schools for three days. So I'm pretty excited by that. But this is what Wolfridge looks like in a normal, uh, well, not right now, we'd have snow on the ground, but <laughs> a normal sort of action is that we have teachers and students out learning about natural history. Uh, Lake Superior is necessarily a big part of what we do. We've got 100 acres down in Lake Superior that we use as well. We've got an organic farm uh, that is producing a majority of the vegetables that we eat in a year. We didn't store all of those this year. We sold them as CSAs. Uh, we also uh, spend time adventuring outdoors, uh, whether it be rock climbing or cross country skiing and necessarily alternative energy and role modeling different ways to live sustainably uh, is, is something that we do. So where am I? Finland, Minnesota. This map, you can see where, where I'm located, right about there in Finland, Minnesota. You can see where North House is. And then Duluth is down there at the bottom. So those of you not familiar with the geography, I wanted to give you a sense of where we're at here uh, before I actually started. The topic is lichens. And so when you look at that stick, what I want you to recognize is that that stick is about as thick as your little finger. Take your little finger and just sort of hold that up and imagine packed with lichens. I was walking uh, in the woods not too far away from here. This is maybe about 15 years ago. And, and I found that stick and I was floored. I couldn't believe it. And I took a close up picture of it and had no idea what I was really looking at. Maybe it was longer than 15 years ago now. But the point is, is that, is that it was just filled with lichens, all those different species right there. And so the first question that we need to answer is, what are lichens? Well, lichens are a symbiotic relationship between fungi and either algae or bacteria, or sometimes it can be all three. Now, there are lichenologists who still refer to lichens uh, by a species, and that's how I'm going to refer to them for simplicity. But most lichenologists don't refer to them as a species anymore. That species is, is listed and it only really calls out the fungi. It doesn't call out the species of algae or bacteria, which can be identified and are identified down the species as well. So when you're talking about the lichen symbiotic relationship, they're only telling and giving the name of the fungi, which is interesting, right? And if you think about the five kingdoms of life, if you think of that sort of model, five kingdoms of life, there's animal, plant, and then fungi, algae, and bacteria. So this is a symbiotic relationship between three kingdoms of life. It'd be like if we had uh, a, a system where we took a deer and, I don't know, uh, a, 
uh, a, pick a tree, any tree, you know, a cedar tree or something like that, that was in the plant. So we'd have an animal on a plant and that we, we clumped that together in some sort of a union and said, that's just a deer. And we ignored the cedar tree, for example. That would be weird, right? From our current perspective, but that's exactly what happens with these. And, and that there's some lichenologists who believe that, that the species of, of the way that we look at it can change over time. So if you went and looked at a particular organism that was a lichen and you gave it one name, you might be able to show up 30, 50 years later and they believe that those can shift species. And so I have a friend, Tammy, uh, who I'll talk about later, who's actually doing some of that research to see if lichens can shift species with our current understanding of species within that. Lichens are magical as well. Lichens get everything that they need from the air. So the humidity or the rain or the snow is their moisture. And then they get everything else uh, from the air. The thing that they're attached to is just their attachment so they don't blow away, so they don't get uh, uh, broken away. They can, they can either hang up in a tree or on a cliff face, or they're holding on to a piece of uh, territory on the ground, uh, that they're not actually getting anything from that substrate that they're on. They're getting it all from the air. Now, whenever a scientist or, or anybody who's talking about science makes a, a bold statement like what I just made, you know it's not true. <laughs> In other words, there are some things that they might get, but for all practical purposes, they don't get anything from what they're connected to. They get it from the air. That's pretty magical. And they grow very slowly. This particular uh, green shield lichen that's growing on this maple tree is uh, right down the road here from my house uh, by our neighbor's driveway. And uh, I think I took this picture back in 2002 uh, and it looks almost the same. Uh, it, it, it's larger, sure, but it basically looks the same. So you can return to lichens year after year after year uh, and assume that they're going to be there. It's not always the case, of course, but uh, they grow very slowly. So there's the symbiosis, there's the magic, and growing slowly. Now, a lot of people would stop right there and say, that's lichens. There you go, you've got the whole story. But what I wanted to do was to make sure that we started with that piece and then actually build from that with lots of stories. I have three stories in particular that I wanna share with you. And uh, what's gonna happen is that I'm gonna uh, sort of uh, spice it up with a little bit uh, more facts about lichens, but it's more the story, more the adventure of looking for lichens, uh, because that's what really draws me to lichens is the places that they grow are, are magical as well. And I love to adventure there, but also uh, just the, the adventure looking for them is magical. And, and I, I get a kick out of that. So James Krupa, professor of biology and such, he once said, I'm of a dying breed. I am a naturalist. And so when I identify myself as a naturalist now, I think about this quote that maybe I'm one of the last ones around. Oh my gosh. And I don't agree with him. I think that there are lots of people who are naturalists. They just don't know it yet. They just don't know it. And so uh, it's not that a naturalist has to be an expert in anything. A naturalist has certain behaviors. And I suspect that some of you have these behaviors that you value slowing down, noticing things around you, taking notes, and then sharing with others. And really, I believe that those are the hallmarks of a naturalist. Slowing down, noticing things around us, taking notes and sharing with others. And so if you do those things, you're a naturalist. I think about just looking out my window over here and watching the birds, that I'm not trying to list all the species necessarily, but I love watching those behaviors and I slow down, notice those, and sometimes I actually take notes. My wife's actually better at taking those notes of the birds, and then we share with each other. It doesn't have to be the whole world, sometimes just with one person. And that's where I wanted to start this story that Charlie was a naturalist at Wolf Ridge, and now he is a, a, a math teacher in two harbors, actually, and he still considers himself a naturalist. Uh, but uh, he and I were hiking not too far away from here, just off the Superior Hiking Trail, at a place called Section 13, 
big cliff that you can see up there. And then these giant boulders, this talus slope right here. So we were going around there and, and he was hopping around looking at different things. And, uh, and I thought that was really nice because I wanted to teach him about lichens, but we were also um, moving along. We needed to get someplace. By the end of our adventure, we were standing up on top of the cliff looking back. And he said, hey, Joe, I saw this yellow lichen down there. What was it? And I was like, huh, yellow lichen. Well, and I described this lichen to him. This is a crustose species uh, that looks like it's been spray painted onto the rock. It's called yellow map lichen. And I said, Charlie, was it this? And I described it to him. He said, no, 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 not that at all. So then I thought a little bit and I described another one. Powdered sunshine, Charlie. And that's probably what it is, uh, that, that it's this folios lichen. And typically it grows on a stick, but I don't know, maybe it was growing on a rock there. And he said, no, 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 that's not what it was. And I was flummoxed. I had no idea what he was talking about. So I asked him to take me back. It was too late. So we had to go back a few days later. And when we went back, this is what he showed me. I had never seen this species before. I had no idea what it was. You can see that it's not spray painted onto the rock. You can see that it's not a flat leafy sort of a thing. This is like a shrub that's, that's poking out there. And I had no clue what it was. So I took a picture. I put it on a website, which I'll teach you about uh, later, iNaturalist. And then I ended up getting a few people who gave me some ideas. Eventually I got connected with a naturalist who went down there and hiked around with me and identified it for sure. And this is a brand new species to Minnesota. Pretty cool. A guy who was just hiking along, didn't know the lichens at all, and he noticed a brand new species to Minnesota. This is where we should find it. Now, this particular map that I got shows that there's a dot way down there in Tennessee and North Georgia. Uh, I either suspect that that actually is air or Maybe there's this one little spot up there in the mountains in North Georgia on, on the Appalachian Trail. I don't know. But the point is, is that you can see that it follows that chain of the Rockies and it's way up there in the Yukon Territory and then all the way across up there, Ellesmere Island and such, that this particular species wasn't supposed to be in Minnesota at all. And so we checked into it and realized that, that when you have a north facing slope and you've got big boulders where water can collect, snow can collect, then what happens is that it keeps almost a, a, a glacial sort of a quality to it. And that likely what happened is as the glaciers were leaving, this particular species, which is Volpicetta juniperinus, um, and I can't remember the common name right now. That's why I was stalling because I couldn't remember the common name. But anyway, uh, this particular species probably hung on right there and was able to continue to grow. And, and after we learned this, uh, I went back there and sure enough, right around where it's growing, there's this giant sort of cavernous system underneath it and cold air was blowing out of there even though it was a warm day. And so it was able to hang on and, and we were able to not, not only identify a new species to Minnesota, but identify possibly a new habitat. And that might take a few more years before some scientists buy into that we have a new habitat here, um, but that was pretty cool. So it was all about this lichen, just finding something brand new, slowing down, noticing the things around us, taking note of it, and then sharing with others. That's what Charlie did. He's a naturalist. And through that story, we learned that there are three different structural, uh, 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 th three different ways that the lichens can grow. They can be crustos, they can be folios, they can be fruticose. So the crustose is like spray painted on. Folios is that leafiness, and the fruticose is a shrubby. And those shrubby uh, types of lichens can be like this particular species that comes from the ground up, or they can be the ones that are pendulous hanging from the trees, the beard lichens that hang, and those are fruticose as well. So through that story again, we learn three different things. And here's my second story. So this is not too far away from where I live in Finland, Minnesota. I was hiking along and I saw this big north facing cliff. Remember north facing cliff, there was that other one which had new species and I thought 
maybe this big north facing cliff has something interesting as well, because this is a ways back in the dirt roads that are back in the forest, and I wanted to go and explore. So this is a quality that I think naturalists have as well, that these planning of adventures, they go out and they discover something, they document it, they share it, and they do a little research and they plan new adventures, hopefully with more discovery. So really that's another take on the same thing that I just said right there. This is what naturalists do. So I plan my adventure. All right, so I'm gonna go out there, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna check out these lichens. Wait a minute now, north facing cliff. Tammy wants me to find a particular species of lichen out here as well, which is called a freckle pelt. Uh, and, and maybe it'll be here as well because there's this creek, which is gonna provide a num a, a, enough humidity to the area. It's a north facing cliff. Yeah, maybe I'll be able to find that there. This is the species that Tammy wanted to find, that lichenologist friend of mine. So you can see Highway 1, Finland is right there. That red box is where the cliff is, somewhere in there. And as I zoomed in, you can see that this is the Moose Walk Trail, which is a great name. I love that. And the cliff is between those two arrows right there. And I had never been all the way out there before. I typically stop someplace else out on the trail and just look at that cliff. But this time I wanted to get out there. So I did. Walked out there, and this is what it looks like from up on top of the cliff as I look back down the creek, uh, down on Hockaman Creek is the name of that right there. And this is Tammy. She wanted me to find that lichen. Why? Because she wanted to be able to get some uh, genetic samples from it to be able to see what it is and then be able to go back to it year after year after year. She also wants to be able to study how uh, the different components of the symbiosis talk to each other. Uh, when does one of them say, all right, time to turn on, start, time to start photosynthesizing. And the other says, great, I'll give you this, this kind of resource so you can actually make something out of it for me. And the other says, okay, how do they communicate? She wanted to be able to learn how to do that. And in fact, even before this presentation, about 15 minutes before she sent me an email and she said, is there still snow on the ground? I wanna go see those lichens. <laughs> There's snow on the ground. So when I went out there, one of the first things that I saw was this, Canada U. Now, around here, Canada U is not all that common. And, and when I see that, I typically note it because that means that white-tailed deer probably haven't spent much time there, so they're not chewing everything up. And it probably hasn't been cut in that area. Hmm. So this is great. So no logging and no white-tailed deer and the humidity and the north facing cliff, this is gonna be good stuff, right? And as soon as I dropped down the edge of the cliff, this is what I found, the lichen that she was looking for. This is that freckle pelt. And now, not only is it relatively uncommon around here, oh sure, you'll see a little spot of this out on Artist Point in Grand Marais. And now that you have it in your eyes, if you go down there, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's, it's right when you get out onto the little island part right there, Keep your eyes open, you'll see it, but you won't see a population this big. I put my water bottle beside it. I heart lichens, of course, and you can see all that green that's right there. This is a huge population, and not only was this patch huge, but I found it all along the edge of that cliff right there. Lots of populations, and I know Tammy's going to be thrilled about this. And as I went walking along, there were some big boulders, some of that talus, and there was all this other type of lichen that was growing on the rock and on the ground as well. And so we've got, this is a, a variety of species of reindeer lichen. And in fact, this right here, this is called a starry tip, star tip reindeer lichen, Cladonia stellaris. And, and that I've never in all of my life seen such a huge population of this all in one spot around here. Now I'm sure there are places where this is pretty common to be able to see something like this. But for me to see that around here, that's really unusual. And I was even finding some mountain fern moss. I got to get my ferns in there and the club mosses. And that, that this particular species is not common around here. If you go up on what we're going to call the real North Shore of Lake Superior up in Canada, you find it up there. But it's not too common on this part of the North Shore. It's different than some of the other club mosses in that you can see where the spores, the sporophylls, are hidden right in there in the leaf axles as opposed to being at the very top. 
that's just another story. But as I was going along, I ended up getting to a part where there was a, a little spruce tree. You can see that right there that was growing out of a crack in the cliff. And I had to take my big camera because I wasn't about to climb up there to go look at this. And I took a close up picture with my big lens. And, and sure enough, I have Methuselah's beard lichen, which is growing right there. It's really uncommon as well. Methuselah's beard lichen uh, out uh, in British Columbia apparently can grow to be six to nine feet long, this lichen that just drapes off the big trees there. And there isn't much around here on the North Shore. I have seen some up there on Kadans Creek around Grand Marais, and I do know that there are the northern Perula warblers that will use this for nesting material. Anyway, I've never seen it around here, so I knew I had a spot, a great spot. And so there we go. Finland, Minnesota, Highway 1, I followed the little dirt road back there, ended up uh, hiking back. And you can see the little red dots down there, those little flags from A to H. As we zoom in a little bit more, you can see all the different spots where I had that particular species that Tammy was looking for. And I had said that it was all along there. These are just the ones that I decided to mark and put on the map. It's there. So I put it out on iNaturalist, which I'll teach you more about. And you might be wondering, well, okay, why are you showing me very rag lichen that's there? Well, it turns out that iNaturalist is a website uh, for other naturalists to be able to communicate with each other. And as soon as I put this particular uh, host of lichens on there, another guy, Blue543 is the handle that he goes by, he contacted me and he said, hey, I've been out to that cliff. Did you get to see the very rag lichen? I'm like, no, I've never heard of it before. Well, there's a reason I've never heard of it before. It's because it's extremely uncommon here in Minnesota. So he contacted me again and said, you should get out there and go find it. I went to find out where it was and look, that's the dot right there. And if you remember the other map, it's all mixed right in with the other lichens. Well, now we have snow on the ground, but you saw that was on a rock. I went out there looking around. I didn't find it yet, but I'm going to find it. It's one of the... Uh, uh, points of the natural heritage information system for rare plants uh, and rare animals and other different types of things. And so uh, the fellow who contacted me works with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, and he had been out there and he found this, put it out there, uh, that, that, that it was this rare species. And when I did a little bit more research, I found out that it's really, really rare around here, like I said, that you can see where Minnesota is, there's that one little dot that's the one that he found. But you can see that it goes along with what we'll call, again, the real North Shore of Lake Superior, and also over there in Washington and Oregon. But it's really, really uncommon around here. I'm hopeful I'll be able to find it. The only other place that it's been found is out on the Suzy Islands. And so this is a website that I'm going to show you as well, that you can get into uh, the different herbarium uh, uh, records and be able to find out what's around you. And so the Suzy Islands are up uh, just off of uh, Grand Portage there. And so those dots up at the top right there, Grand Portage, all those dots out on the islands, that's where that particular species has been located by professional lichenologists. And the arrow shows where we are here in Finland. So it's, a, it's an exciting new find, actually. And, and to be able to find that uh, here would, it would be thrilling. And maybe there are other spots. We just haven't found them yet. And it was all because I was looking for this, for Tammy, that we started to find some of these other stories. And so adventures, that's the best way to be able to find some of these lichens. So what do we learn from this? We learned that lichens can grow on the ground on rock and on trees. So in amongst all these stories that I've shared with you, I've really only taught you a few things, but it's wrapped up in the stories, which I hope you get wrapped up in, and I hope you wanna create some of your own stories. But here's a little bit more. So if you look at this map of Lake Superior, and unfortunately, the, I, I, now I realize that it doesn't have the, the darker red is a higher number of species. It's about uh, 700 species out on Isle Royal for that same size area. And if you took that island and plopped it down in the light yellow, it would be about 100 species per that unit area. So you can see that where we're at, around Grand Marais, Thunder Bay, Isle Royal, over towards Voyager National Park, that's where we have most of our diversity. But as you head south towards the Twin Cities, or if you head out over the UP, uh, that there are fewer and fewer species. 
Now, I don't have a map showing all of North America. That would be fun to see, especially since we have people all over North America right now. But you can see at least right around here that the majority of our species, the, the intensity, the, the diversity is really out there on Isle Royale, about 700 species. And this is what the rocky shoreline of Lake Superior looks like. And so we have all of these. When you go out and, and you notice some of these orange lichens, you know that you're on the North Shore. This is such a beautiful lichen. It's called elegant sunburst lichen. When you look up close, it just really just, just pops right out at you. Now, part of the reason I wanted to show you this is because I wanted to share the story of how tough lichens are. Well, they're already growing out there on the rock, out on Lake Superior with all the waves and all the ice action, but they're even tougher than that. So the European Space Agency, can't remember what year this was. Let's say it was 2006. It was sometime back there. They uh, sent out a, a, a spaceship out there, and they sent a particular capsule that had different things in it and, and different uh, bits of life from the planet. And they wanted to find out how it fared when it was out in space. And so they sent this particular lichen species out with it, Xanthoria elegans. And it went out into space, and then they opened it up so that all the perils of space could attack it and do what it's going to do. You know, the temperatures, the radiations, the, you know, all the other different things that, that might be uh, happening out there that would be tough for us to survive. In fact, we wouldn't survive, right? And they left it out there for about 16 days. And then they closed it up and brought it back. Now, all the other things that they brought back, they were all dead. And there was a lot of cell damage. Uh, uh, but I suppose if you're dead, that's good enough uh, as far as the science is concerned. But it turned out that not only was this still alive, but there was virtually no cell damage. And part of the reason why they sent it out there was to be able to see if life could have started on another rock out there someplace in space. And then maybe that rock carrying that life went through the atmosphere of Earth, landed on Earth, and was able to spread life to another planet. Or maybe a big rock hit our planet, knocked life off of our planet, and it floated out there into space and landed on another space. Is it possible for life to have survived? Well, if it only takes about 16 days, sure. And that's also not accounting for the entry or the exit through our atmosphere where uh, all the, uh, the, the friction would start you on fire, right? And they thought about all those different things. 16 days, not very long. It turns out that several years later, I think it was about seven years later, in, in fact, that they brought down their other, their second little capsule. They had left it out there. And certainly all those other things were dead. They knew that was going to be the case. And this particular thing, this species, it was still alive. There was cell damage, but it was still alive. That is tough. So the next time you're out on Lake Superior, you can wonder if there are Martians around you. It's possible that this started on Mars, or it's possible that there's life on Mars that started on Earth and traveled there. It's possible. That's pretty cool. This is what it normally looks like when I'm doing one of these uh, workshops uh, in Graham Ray, and this is out on Artist Point. And uh, that, that when you get down there and you look at the rock really, really close, you get to see all different types of species. And this is some of what they're noticing up close. And so it, you have to look closely, but there's probably about five or six species right in there on that tiny little picture. And so there's a lot of diversity in a small space. Not only are they really tough, but there's an incredible amount of diversity. Now, with those two things, you'd think that lichens would be just everywhere. And yet, when we look at this picture, notice that there's certainly different colorations in the rock, and those are predominantly lichens. But a lot of people have walked out on Artist Point. Keep this picture in your mind and look at this next picture. You can tell that very few people have walked on this part of the shore. So just a few of us have been walking on this part of the shore. This is some of the uh, Wolf Ridge property that we have out there and it was never developed. And what we hope to do is we hope to keep it uh, virtually untouched for most of it, but we want people to see at least what some really untouched landscape of Lake Superior looks like. 
look at that rock. It's completely coated in species. And if we just went running around there, it would look like Artist Point eventually, which don't get me wrong. I think Artist Point is beautiful, but the diversity of lichens out there is really low now compared to what it could have been. So what did we just learn? We learned that lichens are really tough. There's a lot of diversity and humans do have an impact on them. We've learned that they can grow on the ground, they grow on rock, they grow on trees. We've learned that there are three different uh, growth forms, crustos, folios, and fruticose. And we've learned that they are a great example of symbiosis. They are pure magic and they grow very slowly, sometimes for thousands of years. The next time you look at a lichen, think about all those types of things that there's a lot more to the story. And the adventure stories are what I wanted to share with you. Now, my personal goal in whenever I do these presentations is not just to give information, but what I wanna do is inspire people to get out, okay? Whether you're in Nacogdoches, te Texas, or whether you're in Boston, or some of the other places that I remember right now, Green Bay as well. And so what I wanted to do was to teach you a little bit about the behaviors, which I think I did through uh, telling some of those stories. Slow down, get out there, notice things, share. There are some books, of course. Told you that I have a book. There are lots of different books. Uh, the book that, that I ended up writing, uh, Lichens of the Northwoods, is really great for the, the Lake Superior region. Uh, but I'll tell you, if you're down in Tennessee, it's not going to do you much good, really. And that there are different books for different regions. And so you should check into that. And then there are also some online resources. Now, Jessa, I'm looking at the time here, and so you're going to have to holler at me if I'm going to go too long, but I've got about maybe six to ten more minutes of what I'd like to share. You're all good, Joe. That's awesome. Good. When I see that number of participants go down to zero, then I'll know that I went too long. <laughs> So iNaturalist, I've mentioned this to folks, and really, you should check into it. If you don't already have an account, it's free. You can be a citizen scientist and add to our growing understanding of life on this planet. And that I've been using it for a long time, and I ended up learning about my moths, M-O-T-H-S, the flying things, the moths. I learned about them because of a fellow who lives down in New Zealand who checks my observations that I put on this website to let me know what I'm seeing. And so people all over the world join in on this. Lichens, that's one way that you can learn from experts. There's also this other website that I'll share with you too, the Consortium of North American Lichen Herbaria. And not only will I share with you the, the, the website, the address for it, but uh, also I want to show you how to use it just a little bit, because I think that once you know how to use it, then it's going to be an amazing tool for you. And then finally, I just wanted to let you know that I keep a daily blog and that these uh, images right here happen to be just a daily blog of uh, the lichen uh, notes that I've taken, that I do things on snow and things on birds and all kinds of different things. And I've been keeping this uh, blog since uh, 2015, every single day. I'm at 1,700 and some blog posts right now. And you can count that uh, today's image is going to be a screenshot of uh, how many people came to this so that my mom, who's probably the only person who reads my blog, will be proud of me. <laughs> and so that's where it takes me. I wanted to stop using this, but I'm going to show you uh, some other things. Whoops, screen sharing has stopped as the shared window is closed. Oh, whoops, made a mistake there, didn't I? See if I can go back and do this again. Boom, I want to go there, share. And then how did I get this down here? Hmm. Boom. Well, first I wanted to share this with you. So this is iNaturalist. And what I wanted to do was let you see that you can use this as a database for life on the planet. And again, it's the entire planet. And so if you wanted to find lichens in China, you could go to this and type that in there. But what I want to do is I want to be able to type in a particular species, Caloplaca uh, grimia. Let's see here. There it is. And when I type that in, you'll see that there's one dot on shovel point. 
I am so proud that I was able to get that on there. It's the only location of that species in iNaturalist. Now, hey, wait a minute now. It's all over the world, okay? It's just the only one for iNaturalist because I put that in there. And so you can see that if I zoom back out a little bit, that it's out here. Tetagu State Park is right over here. And so you can see out on Shelva Point, I put that there. Now, I knew it was there uh, because I checked the other thing here. Let's see if I can get to that. And I typed it in in this consortium of North American lichen herbaria. I typed in Caloplaca uh, grimia. Let's see if it pops up. It does. And I typed in Minnesota. And then Lake County is where I'm at. Yeah, select Lake County. And I said, list the display. And it came up and you can see, I've already shown an image, something similar to this. You can see that there's this Calaplaca grimier right here by Clifford Wetmore in 1998. And he has another one in 1998. They're both the same date right here. One is in the Bell Museum and one is in Drexel University. You see what lichenologists actually more than just lichenologists, but at least uh, Dr. Wetmore, what they like to do is they'll collect multiple specimens of something when it's really unique, and then they'll trade with other lichenologists for other lichen herbaria so they can build up their museum or their library, if you want to think of it that way. And so this is right out on Tedigo State Park on Shelva Point. I was able to look at this, and I knew that it was out there. So what does it actually look like? We never even looked at that, did we? So what I need to do is go back and see if I can get this. And I'm going to click on that. And so you can see that this particular lichen, well, Joe, which one is it? There's all kinds of different things growing there. It's the orange one right there, not the yellow and not the gray back there. Those are all different species. But you know how I said lichens will grow, let's see, on the ground and on rock and on trees? If they're growing on the ground, they're called terracolis lichens. If they're growing on trees, they're called corticolis lichens. If they're growing on the rock, they're called saxicolis lichens. See, I oversimplified. There are some lichens that will only grow on other lichens, and they're called lichenocolis lichens. That's what this is. And so I totally oversimplified, and I apologize, didn't mean to deceive you, uh, but lichens uh, will grow on lots of different things. I suppose if a human stood still and a lichen was able to get root, then there'd be human acolis lichens, but there aren't, okay? But the point is, is that, is that I was able to find this because I was able to use those websites and learn a little bit about that. But let's imagine that what I wanted to do now was I wanted to be able to find just common lichens. Let's see here, common lichens, boom. And I wanted a location. Let's say Austin, Texas, there you go, Austin, Texas. And then I go and it says that there are three observations of two species. Let's see which two species they are. They're just the shield lichens right there. And then this Robergia, well, I've never heard of that particular species, but it's this right here. Let's, let's look at it up close. So it's that powdery white right there, the crustose lichen that's growing out there. So not very many, right? But if I type in common lichens and whoops, messed up common lichens, there you go. And I wanted to find them in Lake County, not Illinois, Minnesota. There we go. That'd be the Chicago area, wouldn't it? There are 210 species of uh, lichens that have been put on iNaturalist. You can see those right there. And you can also see that there's a big big red spot right there. That's where I live. Okay. So clearly I've been out looking at lichens and I've traveled around, but not all of these are my observations. You can see that bearded guy right over there. That's me. That's all those different types of things, the granite fire dot and those other ones. So 210 species, right? And we can even look at that, click on that and find out which ones are the most common. Well, <laughs> appropriately, common green shield is the most common one, 157 observations. And then the mealy pixie cup, really cool one and on down the line. So not only can you get a sense of the species, you can also get GPS points as long as they're not rare and endangered species. Uh, iNaturalist has it such that they will block it so they won't give you the exact location data if it's a rare or endangered species.
Okay, so 210 species. I want you to remember that because we're gonna do the same thing with this. We're gonna go back here, Minnesota, Lake County, and I'm gonna delete that. So we're not looking for just one. We wanna find all the species in Lake County. And so it comes up and I'm gonna get my species list. And if I was a professional lichenologist, 747 species. All right then, game on. I need to get out there and observe because I've only found maybe 210 species when there are a possible 747 species in Lake County. So you can use these different websites to get a sense of what might be out there. And so let's imagine that the, uh, let's say the Buellia, let's see here, we'll pick this one. You can click on it as well. And yeah, I picked the wrong one. The point is, is that, is that sometimes they'll come up with pictures here so you can get a sense of what they look like, but you can type in Buella Arn, Arnoldii <laughs> and be able to get some pictures on, on the internet as well, just to get a sense of what it is that you're looking for. So these are great fun tools to be able to use. So in addition to books, that there are online resources. And then also, like I said, the, my, my uh, uh, daily blog. And my daily blog is such that if you were to click on something, March 28th, this Glossier Talus, that you can see just a little bit. I mentioned the Vulpicida juniperina, that particular yellow species I was talking about, and just a little bit of information and then some links uh, if you wanted to, to learn a little bit more. So those are some of the resources that I have and that what will happen is that um, before we're all done, I suppose, Jessa, we can maybe put it in the chat, uh, uh, a particular website that people can go to. Is that true? That would be a great spot for it. Sweet. So what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to click back. Whoops. Oh, goodness gracious. Oh, you get me using a computer and I get all flustered. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make sure that I, I put the website address for my blog uh, in here so that people can access that. And from that, all those other websites I was talking about, and actually a few more will be on today's blog post. And so I'll make sure to do that. So let's see if I can now stop sharing. I did that properly that time. Whew. I was supposed to be done at 7.45 and it's 7.48. I think I did it, Jessa. You're doing great, Joe. <laughs> no, and I we have got lots of really great questions for you. Excellent, Ready? excellent. All so right. The, I can read the, the chat and, and things are just cruising by right there, but you said there's this whole question and answer thing. I'm gonna let you be the, 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 the mastermind behind All that. All right, so let's mind. see if we can get to them. We've got about 20 of them already, but many of them are duplicates, so. A couple of questions about lichens and their sensitivity to air pollution and if they're uh, like an indicator species. Absolutely. The Forest Service uh, uh, has been working really hard on that, especially over in Washington and Idaho, that there's been a lot of work uh, on, on looking at the air quality and using them as indicators. But that, that started a long time ago, actually, that they're... Um, in the United States, what we would do is we would put an electrified uh, a, a vacuum on a pole someplace and we would have filters in it and it would suck it through there and somebody would have to go collect all those and they'd take those to a lab. In Russia, what they do is they go up to Siberia and they get some beard lichens and they put them in an onion bag and they tie them on a pole in a city. And then after a year, they take it and they take it into a lab and they check it for pollutants. So lichens will absorb those pollutants just like if we had a filter, right? And that, that the, when those pollutants are bad, then they will certainly kill them off. There's been research to show that if you measure from the center line of a highway and you go off to the side there, that there's a certain distance that pollutants from our car will drop, you know, the air pollutants, that they're heavy enough that they drop as dust, and that beyond that line, uh, that, that you'll get more diversity. And so absolutely they're affected by that. Mm -hmm. Great. Lots of questions about uh, humans and lichens. Are they edible? Uh, questions about using them as dye stuffs and uh, human impact. Yeah. Wow. So um, 
the voyageurs and other adventurers uh, are known to have eaten rock tripe. So if you are familiar with rock tripe, it's the big leafy one that grows on the rocks. And so sometimes it can be as big as a dinner plate, uh, that big brown uh, rock tripe up in Boundary Waters. And, and that some people have eaten that. And then um, there's some other lichens that have been ground up and put into things uh, where maybe they've baked a bread to give it a texture. But here's the thing is that voyageurs would eat anything, absolutely anything, right? You'd have to be really hungry. <laughs> And so uh, people who have studied the nutritional value of lichens, they have found that there is no nutritional value for humans. We cannot digest it. And in fact, what they have found is that the acids that are in that will give you ulcers. And that the ways that then voyageurs, and I've looked this up, the ways that voyageurs made it that they could add lichens to a stew and not hurt their stomach too much from the acids is they would take wood ash and put it into the stew as well. And so exactly it's getting better, right? Oh my gosh. And so eating, not really, but sure. Voyagers will eat anything. So natural dyes, absolutely. And that uh, what I understand is some of the Harris tweeds originally that they were dyed using lichens. And the problem with that is that you have to collect so much lichen, it grows so slow that the lichen populations uh, where they were making those original Harris tweeds, that, that, that particular lichen population is really beat down. And so I try to stay away from that, but I tell you what, if you were to go and find lichens that were on branches that had fallen to the ground, they're going to die anyway because they need to be up in the air column. They can't grow down on the forest floor. And so if you were to collect those, no problem. You're not going to hurt the population. And that, that there apparently are some purple dyes that you can make from some beard lichens if you have the proper mixture. And I think it's, I can't remember what it is. You'll have to look it up. Somebody who's, who's asking that, I do know that you can get dyes from it. Great. Uh, let's see. Um, do lichens have any natural predators? And if they are moved from their natural habitat, will they die? Just spoke a bit to that. I did see, and my stories usually go all over the place. And so I feel like I've answered just a little bit about that, about people carrying it and moving it someplace. So birds, hummingbirds, uh, when they make their nests, they make them out of spider silk. So they'll go and they'll take a web apart and they'll make a, a, a nest and then they'll take uh, some down from maybe like a dandelion or something like that and put it on the inside, but then they'll affix lichens to the outside of it. And if you ever find a real hummingbird nest out there, you'll see lichens around it. And so they will use that. Perula warblers use the beard lichens to make nests as well. The big, you know, the draping sort of nest that they can go into. I know that slugs will eat them. They have a rasping uh, mechanism that they'll, they'll scratch away the fungal layer. So it's almost like an Oreo cookie in a sense uh, with the fungus on the top and the fungus on the bottom and algae in the center. So they'll scratch that away and then, I don't know, lick this up, I suppose. I don't know what a slug actually does, but they get to that <laughs> and, and they'll be able to eat that. Uh, eat caribou. Caribou will eat it as well. So the reindeer lichen or the caribou lichen or caribou moss, depending on what you want to call it, it's all the same thing, that they really do eat that. And the Sami people uh, traditionally would be able to move their herds of, of reindeer uh, from place to place. And they would go back to a grazing area once every 50 years, I think was the traditional way, because it takes that long for the lichens to grow back. So there's a few that stories is, to that. That is a really long crop rotation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see, can you talk a little bit about um, equipment and books you might recommend? A um, couple of people asking if folks are using like a, an eye loop or a magnifying glass and if there's any books besides yours that you might recommend. Sure. So, so I think the reason that my uh, publisher said that I wouldn't sell many is because I'm not a very good salesman. So whatever. Uh, but uh, the Lichens of the Northwoods is on Amazon and that you can buy it there. You can buy it in bookstores all over the place where they're weird enough to actually carry a Lichens book. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so it is around. But I'll tell you, if you go on Google, uh, Google on Amazon, and just type uh, in lichens, you'll get a list. And typically, 
uh, the top one that will show up will be Lichens of North America. And I wish I had a copy here. Uh, it's a book that weighs probably 20 pounds. I mean, it's a huge book. And it's the inspiration uh, for me to want to write a field guide that was much smaller, much smaller. And so um, uh, th that, Lichens of North America, probably cost about $100, $130. But if you wanted to really get the best book, that's probably the one. There's a brand new book that just came out, and, and I, I, I've purchased uh, Lycan books from all over the world just because that's what you do when you start to do this kind of thing. And uh, I have uh, a book, uh, Lycans of Costa Rica, and, and this brand new book uh, that is down in Tennessee, Lycans of the Great Smoky Mountains. And, and I've understood uh, that that particular book is the leading edge of what Lycan field guides are going to be like. So I'm excited to see that. I think you asked about equipment. Oh, equipment. Oh, yeah. That, this camera right here. See this tiny little camera? And it's just a Nikon. I wish that I got a, a penny for every time that I told somebody about this camera. Um, Nikon Coolpix. It's an all-weather one. I use this underwater. Uh, I use it in, I carry it with me all the time. And I've been able to trick this so that it can take all the close-up pictures. So all the pictures that you saw in this slideshow are taken with this camera. It's an amazing camera. I am blown away at what it can do. And that I used to carry around a jeweler's loop with me so I would be able to look up close. And that's what all those people in that one picture with their rear end sticking up in the air and they're looking at the rock down there. That's what they were using. But nowadays I take this camera, I put it really, really close to the rock. I take a picture and then I zoom in and look at it right there. Very smart. It's great. Okay, we're about to get extra nerdy. Lots of questions about lichen reproduction and how. <laughs> you know how I said magical? Lichens are magical. Uh -huh. Was that the answer? <laughs> That's the answer. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's so it's eight o'clock. I think there's plenty of adults you can probably. All right, good. Then I'll go. I'll go. I'll go into detail then. <laughs> So um, if you read the books, uh, which I, I did, I read, I read as much as I could uh, when I was in the process of writing the introduction to the Lycans Field Guide, because I wanted to have the, the best science possible, right? So when I read that, it said that, that essentially what happens is that the spore from the fungal part of the symbiosis will get blown someplace and it will presumably land on a wild algae and envelop it and turn it into a new lichen, okay? okay? There's another way that what'll happen is that there's these little things called ceridia or isidia, and basically what it is is it's a ball that has everything in it, and when the weather, when rain or something like that uh, knocks it off, it rolls someplace and it grows, right? So, so we can understand that. Got it. It's got all the parts. But the other thing where it lands on a wild bacteria or wild algae and then grows, that's only in theory. No scientist has ever documented it. And so when I was also writing this introduction, I went and I talked to Clifford Wetmore. He was one of the people that I mentioned right there. And then also uh, Theodore Esslinger. And Theodore Esslinger was the one that I really cornered on this question. I said, okay, Ted, tell me, is that really how they reproduce? And he had to admit that it was just theory that they had never proven it. Hmm. They had taken it in a lab and they've been able to mix things together, but we can do a lot of stuff in a lab that doesn't happen in nature, right? They had sure. done this in a lab and they said, that must be how it works, but they don't know. They just don't know. Fascinating, who knew? Yeah. Unsolved mysteries. Yeah, yeah, oh, oh, oh. And then the, the whole Tammy thing is that Tammy oh, yes. believes that what happens is that is that the the chemistry in there will also change the the fungus component over time to be such that it will shift its its structures and such. And see, this is where I get so confused. But she wants to be able to prove this because she believes that up further up a hill will be the, uh, let's see, the, the, the older ones and down the hill because it rolls down. Yeah, down the, will be the younger ones and that she'll be able to see it changing from young back to old like that. And that she thinks that, that these species, we currently call a different species, but she thinks that it's literally the same ones as down here, just older. And she wants to be able to do the genetic sampling of it and be able to show that it's changing as you, as you go up a hill. And that was for that freckle pelt in particular. Cool. Yeah. Let's see. A couple of um, a lot of people who are wondering if they can get lichen to grow in their garden. 
Okay, so so my wife is a gardener, and so I begged her for us to be able to add some lichens to our, our garden as well. And so she said, fine, move that boulder. And so I moved this giant boulder, and it had no lichens on it. And now it does. It has lichens on it. So if you have patience, you can garden lichens. Also, she had me carry a stump out of the woods one time because it was filled with lichens and, and it had eroded enough. And then we sort of broke the roots out. You know, it was an old like red pine stump or something like that that probably was cut by loggers a long time ago, right? And we, we pulled that out. She had me carry that out and there's lichens all over it and it's still right next to our house. So that's the way we garden them. <laughs> Makes perfect sense to me. All right. I think we're probably getting to the end here. A couple of questions about usnia. Us yes. Yeah. yeah. Old what's man's beard deal? lichen. Yeah, yeah, old man's beard lichen. And so what's the deal? That's the question? Uh, yeah. People use it in tinctures and teas. What's the deal? Oh, that's what's the deal. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so I, um, I know that it has antibacterial qualities. So if you remember, I said that a, a lichen is a fungus, an algae, and a bacteria, or a bacteria, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes what happens is they have antibacterial qualities and bacteria is not part of that symbiosis. And that happens to be uh, the usnic acid or the usnic acid for usnia, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, there's a lot of research at, at Duke University right now about different antibacterial uh, uh, things that we could be using, right? Imagine. Uh, imagine that, exactly. Not antiviral. But anyway, um, so, so they're doing a lot of research on that. And that uh, usnic acid is one of the leading uh, things that they're studying right now. So the hard thing is, is that lichens grow so slow. I can't imagine that they'll ever farm that. Right. It'll just be, let's learn about this and can we reproduce in the lab sort of a thing. But yeah, yeah, it is interesting. Great. Well, I have a question for you. Can you talk a little bit um, to kind of close out here about Wolf, Wolf Ridge and how the Environmental Learning Center has adapted to these conditions? I know North House has had to really improvise to try to continue our programming. And so I'm curious about how you're carrying out your naturalist work there. Mm -hmm. It's really fun. So um, uh, if you talk to different people at Wolf Ridge, they have different models. I'm all about symbiosis. And so I love working with other people. And so I love working with you and uh, I love working with other organizations as well. And so one way that Wolf Ridge is responding is that we're reaching out to other organizations and finding ways that we can uh, collaborate on different things. And so today I was in an hour and a half meeting with other residential environmental learning centers around North America. And we were talking just about that. And that in some respects, what we could do is be able to teach about lichens I don't know that we'll literally do this, but we could teach about lichens across North America and have different teachers in different places. And imagine if I was capable of holding a phone and I was out in the woods and could show people some lichens. So we're doing those types of things as well, trying to collaborate. We are also trying to teach online for different classes, uh, teaching geology, uh, teaching uh, earthworks, which is an art class, uh, is what we've done so far for fourth graders and seventh and eighth graders. And we've only just begun because we only just sort of made it up, right? And then, uh, yeah, and then also uh, we're doing some teacher trainings and going to various schools uh, to try to uh, help people to use the outdoors better. Some of the teachers that desperately, we all want everybody to be able to do things normal, right? And, and so uh, we're just trying to use the outdoors where it will be safer. And so we have that experience of working outdoors. How can we take that and translate that? But I'll tell you, as far as residential programming, no, nope, not happening. This is really tough. Yeah. Not happening. Yeah. Yeah. So if anybody out there is a teacher or has school age kids or knows school age kids, they could reach out to Wolf Ridge for some resources. You bet. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. I see Will oh. has dropped a request right in there. So let's here. see. Joe's going to put some links into chat. There was a request for the name of your camera again, as well as your blog. <laughs> you know what? Because I am so slow at certain things. The only thing I'm gonna put in here is a link to my blog. And what I'm gonna do then is I'm gonna to take tonight and tomorrow morning and answer whatever questions remain. And there you go. I think I just put it in and I'll you put did. them in that blog. And then that way, you'll be able to click on that. And that it's the lichens section of my blog 
And so what will happen is that the, the, the top left corner, that box will be today. Okay. And I won't actually finish it until tomorrow at breakfast, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it'll capture today and I'll be able to have that on there. And that uh, anybody else uh, who wants something from me, you can actually leave questions and comments in that blog as well. And that way then I can respond to those. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we so appreciate your time, Joe, and the chance to connect. I really hope that uh, even this this spring you might be teaching a field like in class at North House again. So I desperately want to. Fingers are double crossed. Um, yeah, yeah. We uh, I should actually say we are opening a whole bunch of classes uh, tomorrow for registration. Uh, about half of them are online, and uh, there's a handful of that will be on campus in ventilated classrooms with masks this winter. So folks should, should check that out at northhouse.org. Um, registration opens tomorrow morning, so there's all kinds of cool stuff there. Uh, a big thanks to everybody for coming. I hope you can join us for uh, Sami Knives next week, as well as we're also doing an online, I forgot about this, online film festival where each week we'll have, we have a really cool documentary um, that will be op available for people to screen for about 72 hours. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then on Friday, we'll have a Q&A um, over lunch with the director of each film. So all kinds of goodies on the North House website, northhouse.org. Uh, hope you guys can join us. And yeah, Joe, can't wait to see you in person soon. Thanks again. Yeah. And Jessa, I want to yeah. say this so everybody else can hear yeah, this. Yeah. Can I get a copy of all those? I got to send those to my publisher. Yes, I can get you a copy of all this stuff. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, everybody.